remain standing, please, for the call to worship. <clears throat> Join me, please. I am like an olive tree. I trust in God's unfailing love. For your love, my God, and all you have done, I will always praise you. Please remember. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just was going to read everything. Please remain standing for our opening hymn, number 62, All Creatures of Our God and King, verses 1, 5, 6, and 7. Gracious and loving God, thank you for your forgiveness and the gift of new life in you. Your love is perfect. It never fails, and nothing can separate us from you and your love. Pour out your presence upon us as we gather to worship you. We pray that our lives will be filled and overflowing with the power of your love. Help us love others to make a difference in this world and bring honor to you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated for the prayer hymn 393.
Um, let's offer to God now the names of those that we would like to lift up in prayer. Yes. Can you tell me the name again? Okay. One more time. I'm sorry, I'm not, I just can't hear you. Ron Frazier. Ron Frazier. Rob. Rob. Sorry about that. <laughs> yes. Chris Kress. Yes. I visited them yesterday, and I was so surprised at how well she looks. She's sitting up in a chair. She hadn't even been to bed yet. I mean, this, since they moved her, she was sitting in the chair, and uh, uh, Jeff and their daughter, Ellen, were there, and she, she just looked wonderful. So we praise God for that. Others? Yes. And uh, Margie, she's also sick. Maybe I should just be sick tomorrow too. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let's keep uh, Pastor Ann in our prayers. And of course, those who are suffering with the coronavirus all over the world. It's a, a pretty bad thing. Others? I know that there are many that you pray for on a daily basis. You, you may not have named those here today, but as we pray this morning, I hope that you will lift them up in your heart to God. And that voice is as loud as the one spoken here today. So let's go to God in prayer. Holy and loving God, we thank you for the blessings that surround us each day. Even though we may be blind to them, you faithfully continue to provide them nonetheless. We thank you for your faithfulness. And Lord, many in our community, in our small community here at Sharonville, are experiencing illness, and they're experiencing a lot. And some of those names were raised this morning, and we ask you to be with all of them, with Rob Frazier, with Chris Cress, with Morgan, and Margie, and Pastor Ann, and with the Bauer family as they are going through the loss of uh, their beloved Tammy. So we pray for these, Lord, and we are in need of your healing grace. Some of us, our bodies are, hit, are ill. Some are in troubled spirits and some in broken hearts and some in conflicted thoughts. We pray for your miraculous healing power to heal that pain within them. We pray, God, that you move among us and you call us out to be in the world and to touch those struggling, struggling daily. Let us be for them your love, your hands, and your heart. And we pray for those who are struggling with the coronavirus. 
with a world that is frightened by it. Many are ravaged by it. Many are fearful of being ravaged by it. Many are fearful for those who they love that are struggling with it. Lord, give us your courage, your strength, your comfort, your assurance that no matter the outcome of whatever befalls in this life, you walk beside us. You give comfort to those who are struggling. Help them find a cure for this virus so that we may once again live in the assurance of your miracles among us. As we begin the Lenten season, help us to solemnly reflect upon our lives, examine our thoughts and the choices we have made in order to come to Easter, a renewed people, ready to claim the gift of Christ as our own and to live fully, freely, joyously as his people. Give us peace, contentment, and humility so we may better show the face of Christ within the world. And in Jesus' name, we offer the prayer he left us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's uh, bring to God our tithes and our offerings, the things that we, uh, we give to him, not only on this Sunday, but during the week and the many ways we stretch out and we help those in need. Um, you know, a, a few pennies to someone who, who might need it at the grocery store or uh, someone on the street that might need a meal or um, a, a charity that you say, you know, I want to be a part of that. I want to reach out. I want to help. This wonderful garden. Be prepared to eat your pie, you know. There are so many ways that we give back to God. And in that, we are so dearly blessed. So let's just look in our pockets and in our purses, and let's give to God what we know God so richly deserves.
you, Lord, for your abundant blessings. Open our eyes that we might see them every single day, that we might be grateful people, humble people. And we ask you to use these gifts that we've brought to you today, that the world might be blessed through them, and that Christ may be the face they see in everyone around them. And in his name we pray. Amen. You may sit down. Well, I didn't bring the bulletin up with me, but I assume it's time for the scripture and for my sermon. So let's just get busy and do that. Um, our scripture today comes to you from two sections, but I'm going to offer first this from Matthew. And it's Matthew 11, 24. Five through 30. And honestly, it's one of my very favorite scriptures. Um, there are many reasons, and there's one part of it I'm going to focus on today. But um, let's read it together. I can find it. Where is it? At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children, meaning us. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal himself. Come to me. All of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest in your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Will you pray with me? Loving God, prepare our hearts and our minds to hear your word for us this day. Work your will in our lives. Amen. Now, we've been talking a lot this last month about John Wesley, the founder of Methodism. And one, but one story about Wesley has not been told. And I think it's probably, to Wesley, the most important story of all. And so this morning I want to tell you about what is called his Alters Gate experience. Because it is here, it is here where Wesley's genuine ministry began. Now Wesley was back in London after his two-year venture in America. And the excitement with which he had left had gone dead. His zeal to convert the unchurched Europeans and the African slaves and the heathen American Indians, well, it had faded. It had fizzled in failure. In fact, some of his more, I'd call them arrogant decisions, related to parishioners there, had made him a great many enemies. And they had pushed to have him brought up on charges. And if he hadn't skipped bail and uh, caught a ship back to England, he would most likely have been in jail because you could do that back then. If a preacher was doing something that you felt was you know, not right, you could bring them up in charges and they could go to jail for a while just to get themselves right a little bit. Well, back at home now, he'd started this new practice of preaching with great enthusiasm. Now, this displeased the rather stoic uh, Church of England, resulting in having a lot of pulpit doors closed to him. He was unable to preach very many places back then. And self-doubts and fears plagued him, especially the fear of death. And for him, this was a sure and certain sign that he was not a Christian at all. 
And he was in a desperate desire, desperately seeking to feel the affirmation of God's assurance of faith. And it continued to elude him. No matter what he had done, it had continued to elude him. So Wesley walked through this spiritually desolate world of his, lost. He did not know what to do. His friends intervened, finally, and they said, you are coming with us tonight to this meeting at Aldersgate. And so he went. And Wesley writes this. In the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society meeting in Aldersgate Street. There, one was reading Martin Luther's preface to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, he even remembered the time. While he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust Christ. Christ alone for salvation and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. For Wesley, this was the beginning of everything. Now let me tell you what I think this story means, and what it means to me, actually. There was, uh, in this time, of his life, Wesley's religion was a head thing. He knew all the answers, he knew all the questions, but he couldn't feel the power of Jesus' love uh, living within him. And his, his head just kept getting in the way. He thought, if I could do this, do this, do this, I could finally feel it. He had like this order of things he had to do. That's where the name Methodism came from. We were a methodical group of how we did things. So he methodically did things every day, and he thought the reward for that would be a, being able to feel this assurance of faith. But you see, his head just kept getting in the way. He... Uh, couldn't let Jesus lead him because his voice and the side of his head was thundering, do this and this and this. And he kept hearing that voice instead of the voice of Jesus. In his younger days, Wesley could at times be what we might call today a holier than thou. And uh, he had to have some of that self-righteous air knocked out of him a little bit by life experience. He had to be brought to understand that as important as book learning is, and it is, it didn't mean a whole lot without the soul knowledge of Christ leading it, guiding it, developing it. So God brought Wesley to a place where he finally got it. He brought him to the place where his head didn't work, and he sat there and opened his heart. And finally, without the head in the way, the heart was able to feel the warmth of Christ's assurance. And he was empowered in a way that he'd never been before. And from that grew the Methodist Church today. Wesley had to get himself out of the way, get his head out of the way, so that the head knowledge he had could be guided through Jesus and the Holy Spirit to make him the man God was really trying to make of him all the time. Now, my sermon today is entitled, Getting Myself Out of the Way. So, yeah, I guess it's confession time for me, too. This isn't just Wesley's story. This is my story, too. 
Not in the exact same way, of course, but uh, if you ask my family, uh, well, at times they might say, oh, she can be a little self-righteous, and yeah, she could, she could be just a, a tidbit, you know, holier than thou. But that's just when they're wrong, of course. <laughs> but that isn't what I had to get out of the way in order for Jesus to come in and say, I want to make you something else. Are you going to let me do that, or are you not? And only then could I begin to move forward. But for me, it wasn't so much arrogance and, um, you know, assurance that I knew the right way. For me, it was self-doubt. For me, it was, uh, what could I possibly bring to ministry? To me, it was, why would God actually want me to do this, to minister in Jesus' name? I mean, what possibly could I have that would be of any use at all? And why would anybody listen to me in the first place? And what if I really messed up? Which, of course, I have of course, many times. But you know, as I look back to it, uh, I see that God had been calling me to ministry for many, many years. When I was a little girl, I think some of you know I was raised as a Southern Baptist. Well, I told my mother once when I was about five or six, I said, Mother, Mommy, I want to be a Baptist nun. She just laughed, just like you did. She thought, oh, that's one of the funny little things that kids say, you know, when you remember that. But me, for me, I was really serious. I didn't know of any other way for a woman to lead because as Baptists, women can't lead. And even at that time in the Methodist church, they couldn't either. So a nun was all I could see and all I knew. So I really didn't know exactly what to do with this. If I couldn't be a Baptist nun, what could I possibly be? Well, the journey God led me on had many twists and turns, often painful turns, and many left deep scars. But, you know, God, always faithful, brought me through, through to meet my husband Mike, to, uh, to meet his family, the Bradleys, and to join their church, the United Methodist Church, where I was introduced to the God I had known all along on a very deep level, and that I, who I eventually came to love and trust with every fiber of my being. So finally, I decided, OK, I'm going to hold on. I grabbed back the reins from the fears and self-doubts that had been driving me and gave them instead into the hands of Jesus. And I held on, and away we went. You see, for me, as it was with Wesley, I had to get my head out of the way in order to really feel the changes that God was making in me, in order to really allow myself to be led by Jesus. And that warming self-knowledge of Christ well, it's pretty much stronger than any self-doubt you have. It's pretty much stronger of, of uh, maybe not knowing all the answers. Because you don't have to, you see. It's because Jesus is with you. And because God is at my side. And yeah, I'm going to mess up. I've done it many times, and I'll do it again. But as long as God's with me, you know, it's going to work. One way or another, it's going to work. Now, this isn't just Wesley's story. It isn't just my story. It's your story, too. So point one I want you to remember today is we need to get ourselves out of the way of the person God is trying to make of us. As Matthew says in our scriptures text today, yoke yourself to Jesus and allow him to lead you his way. Allow the Holy Spirit to get into the core of your prejudices and grievances, your self-seeking ways, and 
your self-doubting thoughts to free you, to make you into the person God's been trying to make you all along. Now, we all have these. We all have doubts. We all have grievances. We all have uh, self-seeking ways. It's just part of being human. But we have to recognize those, and we have to be willing to step aside, to say, okay, you go here, and you stay here, because I'm going to go this way with Jesus, and I'm not going to let those bother me anymore. Maybe a little once in a while, but I'm going to remember who holds the reins of my life. And that's what we do as Christians. Matthew says uh, that we can do this, that Jesus is happy to help us do this. And yet, as As human beings, we're very curious, aren't we? We want to know the end result before we start. It's not faith then. It's just, you know, getting on the horse and riding. Faith requires going ahead, even when you don't know all the answers. But so we ask ourselves, what type of yoke is Jesus inviting us to take on? Well, Matthew says it's easy. Its burden is light. And in it, we will find rest. He also says that when we take the yoke upon ourselves, Jesus will become our teacher, and he will teach us about how to be gentle and how to be humble. In other words, if we commit to following Jesus, he will teach us a gentler way of life, one that is humble and kind, one that is simple, One that is aware of the good and the bad in the world and yet able to make healthy choices, choices that honor ourselves, honor God, and in extension, the world. By making healthy choices, our burdens are lighter. We aren't buried in debt. We don't work so many hours that our family relationships suffer. We don't base our self-worth on how much money we make the way we look, or the power we hold. Instead, and hear this, our self-worth comes from knowing that we are the beloved children of God. And the realization of that truth, that we have done nothing and we could do nothing at all ever to earn God's Unconditional love and grace is life-changing. Like a butterfly emerging from a cocoon, experiencing freedom for the very first time, we are humbled before the goodness of our God. Point two to remember today is that humility is the natural state of a Christian. And you'd say, oh, now, wait a minute. Humility. I'm not sure I like the sound of that. Doesn't that mean that uh, people get to walk all over me? Um, Doesn't that mean smiling sickly when someone, you know, cuts in in front of me in traffic or in line? Isn't that right? And does it mean, doesn't it mean living on leftovers and McDonald's dollar cheeseburgers because we take a lesser paying job? Well, let's see what Paul says about the humble life that Jesus calls us to live in Philippians 2, 1 through 11. I'm going to read to you out of this Bible that I really enjoy reading called The Message. If you haven't uh, picked this up, you might want to look at it one day because I really, really like it. And The Message, it says this. If you've gotten anything at all out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being in the community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. 
put yourself aside, and help others go ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourself long enough to lend a helping hand. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status, no matter what, not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death, and the worst kind of death, that of crucifixion. Because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honored him far beyond anyone or anything ever, so that all created beings in heaven and on earth, even those long dead and buried, will bow in worship before this Jesus Christ, and call out in praise that he is the master of all to the glorious honor of God the Father. Isn't that beautiful? I I just love this Bible. So this life that we're called to, um, you know, it's still a little bit fuzzy, so I want to read to you what Reverend Craig Feinstadt of Water's Edge United Methodist Church in Omaha, Nebraska, Nebraska wrote. It's called 10 Characteristics of a Humble Person. I'd like to share that with you because I think it might offer a little more direction on what it means. So I'm going to read that to you now. I don't have copies of it for you. I wish I did because it's really great. And if you want copies, I'll have uh, Margie go ahead and, and write some, um, go ahead and put it in the newsletter or, or you can call her and she'll give you the link on how to get there or some way we'll get it to you. Just let us know. And uh, Feinstad says, I observe the world and don't see a lot of humility these days, but pride is all over the place. Research demonstrates that humility is closely correlated with courage, integrity, strong leadership, self-control, learning, and better relationships. Here are 10 characteristics of a humble person that move us to the above-listed desired outcomes in life. One, a humble person is teachable. Humility believes it can always learn from the education and experience of others. A humble person is um, a growing person who is quick to read, invite feedback, and ask good questions. A humble person is at peace with themselves and with others. Humility embraces contentment and simplicity. It doesn't need to have the nicest or the best. Humility puts relationships before the need to be right. (laughs) Tell that to your husband, right? Uh, Or wife, yeah. Humility enjoys balance and harmony. A humble person is grateful. Humility isn't entitled. It doesn't feel that we're owed things. We deserve things. Humility believes it doesn't deserve a darn thing and is thankful for the many blessings received in life. A humble person is slow to offend and quick to forgive. Humility is keenly mindful of the grace it has received and is quick to extend that grace to others. A humble person asks for help, gentlemen. Humility helps us know who we are and who we are not. Humility allows us to live authentically. Humility sees assistance and support as an opportunity to develop and not as a sign of weakness. A humble person treats everybody with respect. Humility teaches us to believe that we are not much better or worse than anybody else. 
all people have great value and all people deserve to be treated as such. A humble person is patient, doesn't easily get frustrated, I have to work on that one, with the imperfection of others. Humility knows that mistakes and inadequacies are part of life. Humility is tolerant of self and others when deficiencies appear and failures happen. A humble person recognizes their own limitations. Humility doesn't have a negative view of self. Humility has an accurate view of self. Humility leads us to the powerful and beautiful place of living out our strengths and passions in life. A humble person celebrates the accomplishments of others. Humility sees others as co-pilgrims and collaborators and not competitors. Humility genuinely rejoices when others prosper and triumph. That can be hard for us, can it? Sometimes we have jealousies for other people doing better than we do. A humble person is open to a deep relationship with God. Humility knows God is the creator of the world, and people are the created. Pride elevates self over God. Pride leads us to worship the idols of control, sex, money, and power. Humility leads us to Jesus. Point three of our final uh, time today is to remember, uh, as that I want to share something with you that I remember. It's the words on a banner uh, that hung in the Church of the Servant, uh, United Methodist Church in Oklahoma City. And I've known these word, words for over 40 years, and uh, there's power for me to powerful to me today as they were then. It reads, God's gift to you is who you are. Your gift to God is who you become. Let me read that again. God's gift to you is who you are. Your gift to God is who you become. And when I read Feinstead's list, I said, that's who I want to be. I want to give God that gift of myself of being that person. And irony, I think it's the same person that God's been trying to lead me to be all the time. To claim my gifts and graces with gratitude and be the humble image of Christ. Working, living, loving, giving, choosing Jesus. I'm not there yet, but I want to be, and I'm going to hopefully focus uh, my time in Lent to become so. And even better, let's help each other get there. What head thing do you have that gets in the way of yourself and Jesus? What feelings, I can't do this, I'm better than this. What things are in your head, that voice that keeps going on, gets in your way of hearing that? After a little self-examination, the answer just might surprise you. So I invite you to consider this question this morning for yourselves as you come today to our first Lenten communion meal with Christ. Will you pray with me? Loving God, we thank you for this idea of humility and the richness of how we can live with it. Turn us into humble people so that we might live more fully as the people you call us to be. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. And we're going to have communion this morning, and um, it is our first communion of Lent. Um, we'll come and we'll kneel around the rail and we'll take the communion, and then whenever we rise, we'll go back and we'll have a seat and we'll close our service. Um, this is, Lent is a solemn time. 
it's a solemn time for us to really do some self-examination, to really clean house on who we are, and so that we can come to Easter a new people, renewed, joyous to receive Jesus. So today, when you come, I hope that you will offer God the promise that you will do some self-reflection and that you will bring to him this new person that he is calling you to be. Loving God, we ask for you to pour out your blessings on these gifts of bread and juice of the vine, that they might be for us the blood and body of Christ, helping us to be renewed in your image. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you come as you've been directed by the ushers? Do we have ushers to do that? Or just come, please. Come to the table. Take, eat, eat the bread that is the body of Christ for us, that we will remember his life, that we will practice his teachings, that we will come a humble, loving people he calls us to be. Take the juice and drink. Be renewed by the blood of Christ, knowing that whatever you do, God is with you. You may return back to the world, new people, knowing that God walks with you, that whatever happens to you in this life is a way, is something that can be used by God for good. Amen. Well, that's not the correct
as you leave this place and re-enter the world, go with love. Be a generous friend to those who do not know love. And may you walk with the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the companionship of the Holy Spirit every step you take. Amen.